religion will not save. And yet there's many religions. Religion comes from two words, re and legio, mean to bind back. There's people who are trying to bind themselves back to God by their works. And then you have Christianity. It's not the righteousness you send up to God. It's the righteousness God sent down to man. So God wants you simply to accept or to receive his righteousness. And religions, there's a lot of them. The question comes down sometimes is, should we have respect for other people's religion? If you have respect for the truth, you cannot have respect for the lie. And therefore, I believe that true Christianity is salvation, is by grace, through faith alone. Now, you could look at it like this, and perhaps a lot of people do. Back in the 1700s, there was this old sea captain, and he took all the sailors and put them out there on the deck, and he uh, walked out talking to them, and the wind shifted and blew the smell of those seamen all up into his nostrils. He says, men, you haven't had a bath in three months. Changing from one religion to another religion doesn't solve the problem. Changing clothes with somebody else doesn't change the problem. When Dr. A. Ray Stanford and I went to Egypt, they had a big hospital there, and the guy that was there gave us free reign in the hospital. And so the head doctor of all of Egypt was in charge of this hospital. So he uh, would follow us around as we were given the gospel to the various rooms and all. So they were gonna have a meeting and they're gonna have all the, the doctors and nurses together in this great big old room. So I had went up to one of the nurses there and I says, man, can you do me a favor? She says, sure, what would you like? You see that white coat like the head doctor has on? She said, yes. I said, I want you to go get me one, just like his. She said, okay. So she went and got me one. Now, I didn't tell even Dr. Stanford this. I didn't tell nobody this. Because I had just found out I'm going to be speaking. So if I got to speak, I got to have an idea. So they got me this nice white coat. I mean, full length. So I went up there and I started to talk. And I says, you know, I have always wanted to be a doctor. And I says, and I am thrilled that we have the opportunity to be here at the hospital and for the doctor, I mentioned his name, that was sitting right there. And I said, I want to thank you personally for the opportunity you've given to us to come and to share with you what the Lord means to us and how we can know we have eternal life and so forth. And I said, but there's always something that I've wanted to do. I always, I want to be a doctor. So I went over there and I picked up that white robe and I put it on. I even tied it. And then I turned around and looked at him and I said, now I am a doctor. And they understood enough English without my interpreter. They all laughed. They thought that was funny. I am a doctor. Does anybody need a surgery? I said, now, the truth of the matter is just because I put on a white jacket and I had the doctor there stand up because he's the only one had on another one just like mine. I says, does that make me a doctor because I got on a white jacket just like the doctor? Of course, no. I said, would you want me to perform surgery on you? No. And I said, just because you go to a church doesn't make you a Christian. No more than if you go into your garage and turn you into an automobile. There has to be something else that takes place, and that's the 
the day that you trust Christ as your Savior. Now, I want to share a couple of thoughts with you because I believe that in the days in which we live, once you trust Christ as your Savior, you are a soldier of Jesus Christ. You're in the Lord's army. We're supposed to be about our Father's business. We're in the military. And in the military, we should be disciplined. But have you ever noticed some of God's people in the military are not very disciplined? They can't make themselves do anything. I mean, we have some in the military that are pretty sloppy dressers, actors. They can't do anything. They don't know how to use their weapons. They're just not very good soldiers. Yet the Word of God tells us to endure hardness as a good soldier. Not to be entangled with the affairs of this life that we may please him who have chosen us to be a soldier. So I, I, I'm a soldier. And if you're not a good soldier, you're going to be a bad soldier. And if you're a bad soldier, you're going to be like the dog that ate the duck. You're going to be down in the mouth. Some of y'all will get that about an hour from now. There was a joke there. I hate to explain things. But I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of 2 Timothy and chapter 2. 2 Timothy and chapter 2. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, the Apostle Paul writing to young Timothy, trying to encourage him because he's supposed to be like a soldier. Look at verse 1, chapter 2. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So you and I are supposed to endure hardness as a good soldier. Now, if God is God, why can't God just, instead of making it hard, why can't just God make it it's an easy? Just make it easy for me, Lord. But he doesn't. Endure hardness. Now, you may not enjoy it, but you're to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And some of y'all are in here, you've been in the military, you've gone through boot camp, you know what it's like. And it does teach you a little bit about discipline and so on. Well, the Lord talking about us being soldiers. Uh, look at the next verse. In verse 4, he says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Now, who chose us to be a soldier? That's the Lord. The Lord wants us to be a soldier. And even says in the book of um, Ephesians in chapter 6, talks about the, the warfare that we have. Talks about the armor we're supposed to wear. Uh, the helmet and the sword and the breastplate and our shoes prepared to march. But we, we have a lot of Christians that are A-W-O-L. Anybody know what A-W-O-L stands for? Absent without leave. You didn't have permission to leave the army. God never gave you permission. You're absent without leave. God has not dismissed you. You thought he said parade rest. And he said attend hut. And when you... Uh, serve the Lord, you don't, you don't give the captain orders, you just report for duty. We just report for duty. And the command is already in the word and we're supposed to be busy fulfilling our responsibility as a good soldier. And there's going to be times whenever it might be difficult, but we're to do it anyway. So take your Bible and look at Ephesians chapter 3. The book of Ephesians in chapter 3. There's a verse here that I really enjoy. And as you're in the, the Lord's work, 
And every person here that knows Christ as Savior, you are in the Lord's work. Now, you may not be working too good. And uh, you may not know how to fire your weapon. I remember in the military, whenever we, it was in boot camp, and we go into these drill halls. And then they got a lot of companies in there. And it's in July. It's hot, sweat. And we all march in there, and then we have to face out and stay in there and parade rest. And, you know, you got that little carving out there. And, and then after you stand there, wait for a while. You know, you, you kind of, your legs, you got to try to keep moving your legs. You, you pass out. And you could hear them all over the, the room. Bang! Bang! People falling completely out. Just falling, just falling out. And you're standing there and you're sweating. And you, you feel a little dizzy. And you don't want it to happen to you. So you kind of move your knees without them seeing that you're moving your legs at all. Because if they see you move, that's not a good sign. And then they'll come by sometime and they'll take them. All right, flip it out there. And they want to see if it's clean or dirty and so forth. Then they come out there and, you know, I'm only 17 years old. I didn't have much. I only had three hairs. And, uh, and I only got one now. It's 14 feet long. I just weave it back and forth. But they, you know, they come by and you got to, you know, snap to attention and all. And you have to do all the stuff, you know. Now I, I I love I love boot camp I I, I love it and then I, and I love the march oh I love the march I love to hear hear the song and then just oh I love it and uh, but I I happen to be on the front row and they said up and hut and you pull the snap too you pull it up <laughs> but when I did my hand had gone numb and when I came to my gun kept on going. And I thought, uh-oh, I don't have it. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I felt it coming back to my hand. The guy behind me had caught it and moved it back up into my hand. And then they had you put up here. And right in front of your eye is this, uh, the little sight on the barrel. It's right there at you. And it's like splitting your eyeballs. And all of a sudden, I heard people popping, hitting the floor. And this time when they would fall forward, that was going right between your eyes. And they'd fall and just hit it. And nobody would move. The person on the right, the person on the left, nobody moved to help them. You just stood still. <laughs> I'm glad I saw that. And you just stand there. And uh, it's like they're, they're pressing your endurance, trying to find out how much can you take. Every time I see my guy turn around, I right, give me 25. It took me a while before I finally figured out 25 what? <laughs> Get on there, Arnold! And then you have to do your push ups. And when I first went in, they said, you, you better watch yourself and make sure you salute them because if you don't salute them, they'll have you in the guard house, they'll have you polishing their sh shoes, all the kind of dirty work. I said, man, ain't nobody gonna make me do that. I was saluting everybody. I saluted the guy that I went in service with. I mean, <laughs> If they hadn't got their uniform yet, I'm absolutely, I'm absolutely everybody. I just said the word, absolutely. But you gotta, you gotta learn things, and it, but it, it teaches you discipline to see what you can take and what you can't take. They want to try to weed out people and so on. Don't you know the Lord's military is, is more stringent than the special forces? Requires more discipline because it's not just you know three years. Or four years, or some people they quit, and you know, in twenty years they retire. This, this is this is for your whole life, your whole life. I've been in the military now for almost fifty years. By the way, Friday night was my fiftieth birthday that I trusted Christ as my Savior fifty years ago. Thank you very very much. But the Lord has been so good to me. He really has. But there's just certain verses that kind of helps you to understand about, you know, I, I'm a soldier in the Lord's army. I, I've, been, I've been called for special duty. I'm in the special forces. But look here in Ephesians in chapter 3. Look what it says in verse 20. Verse 20 says, Now unto him that is able to do. 
to him that is able to do it. Some Christians will never be able because they are not fit for the Lord's service. They just won't do anything. They won't prepare themselves. So there's a lot they're not going to experience. But it says, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that now worketh in us. You see, what you're able to do in the future depends upon what God is able to do with you now. The power tomorrow is dependent upon the power that you're using today. If you're not doing anything today, there's a good possibility you won't do anything tomorrow. You see, it's so easy to dedicate your life to the Lord. That's that period of time that I got out there that I don't have yet. And people find it so hard to dedicate today. You see, I've got this moment. I don't have tomorrow. All I got is now. Behold, now is the day of salvation? Yes. So you don't have a guarantee of tomorrow. It is so easy for people to say, I'm going to dedicate my life to the Lord. That period of time they have yet to live, and they forget about it today. So we should serve the Lord today with what we have. And believing that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. I would never have thought that the Lord could never use me 50 years ago. I have been totally amazed. I've been amazed at this church. I knew it was good when I came, but you didn't got gooder and gooder. It's just like the person who had thought that they were pretty good. And he thought that he was just sweet as could be. Then he became a diabetic. He says, now I don't turn to pure sugar. And you never know just how much God wants to do with you and for you. Uh, look in 1 Corinthians in chapter 1. 1 Corinthians in chapter 1. You and I need to understand the kind of a person that God is looking for. What kind of a person makes a good soldier? They're usually looking for somebody who can learn how to keep their mouth shut and do what they're told. I'm serious. That's why they sometimes they'll get right in your face. And they'll holler to the top of their lungs. And they'll try to humiliate you. Shame you. To see what are you going to do about it. Did you know there's things that can happen in life just to test and see what are you going to do about it? Can you handle it? What kind of attitude do you have? I bet you there's some people in this room right now that have a mean, stinking, rotten attitude about something. You came in with a chip on your shoulder. You're mad at something. You're mad at God. You're mad at your husband. You're mad at your wife. You're mad at somebody. I bet you. And it's not your fault. It's always somebody else's fault. Take responsibility for your actions. And look what he says in verse 26. For ye see your calling, brethren, are that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to not things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. You see, with the Lord, God is simply and always using for people that he can use. It is not the super talented person, but the super dedicated person. In this ministry, I get you to say in just about any ministry, positions of service as far as I'm concerned, it's not so much based upon talent, but character, faithfulness. Are you a faithful person, dependable person? Serving the Lord, availability is so important than ability. Because you can have all the ability in the world to do anything, 10 times better than everybody else. 
but nobody can count on you because you're not available. You never have time. Just can't. Find a way to lock into something and say, I can be faithful. Because see, faithfulness, that requires commitment. And commitment might interfere with what we want to do with our life. And so many people are not really a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Uh, in that verse that talks about no flesh and glory in his presence, I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Jeremiah. Now, in the book of Jeremiah, there's a, a verse there that uh, I learned years and years ago that is really good. Jeremiah 33. Jeremiah 33, verse 3. You ever heard of this verse before? Look what God promises to a, uh, a good soldier. You see, there's things that God promises to the soldier that will be diligently fighting the good fight of faith uh, that he don't do for everybody. Uh, notice what he says there in verse 3. Verse 3. Call unto me. And I will answer thee and show thee, get this, great and mighty things which thou knowest not. In other words, God says, call upon me. Ask me. And I'll show you great and mighty things which you have never imagined. You know, I think there's something to it when God says that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole world. Looking for a man that God can show himself strong on his behalf. In other words, God is looking for somebody that he can use. That's totally dedicated to him. That wants somebody that will yield to him. You see, in, in, the, in the military, see, you, you're just supposed to do whatever they tell you to do. Just leave your opinion out of it. They don't want them. They'll tell you how to think. Well, with the Lord, see, God wants to tell you how to think. He just wants you to report for duty. Just, just, Lord, here I am. I'm your servant. Whatever the orders are, that's what I'll do. But see, with most of God's people, all they want to do is argue. Argue. Argue all the time. Arguing with God. You don't see things God's way. You'll argue about everything. What is your role? What is your position? What is the chain of command? You see, there's always in the military a chain of command. I believe there's a chain of command in a home. I believe that I'm, I'm, I'm the head of the home. My wife at the neck, she turns her head. No, but I'm, I'm the head of the home. You say, what does that mean? It means I'm responsible. If a man overhauls a motor and it don't run right when he gets through, He was the mechanic. You can't blame the motor. The man that overhauled the motor. You paint a house and you get through and you say, man, I, that's a stinking job. Well, you, you painted it. You painted it. Don't blame the house. When it comes to your family, I believe God holds the man responsible. And the man can find out a lot about the condition of his family by looking at the countenance of his wife. If she's not happy, she doesn't have a good countenance, she doesn't have peace, then the man needs to go to work try to figure out how can I solve this? Because he's responsible. Yeah, but you don't know my wife. I don't need to know. So when God says, you believe in the devil? Yes, I do. Then why do you believe in the devil? Married a sister. You bless my heart and once in a while y'all get what I'm saying. You know, the, the, deep, the deeper stuff, you know, the truth. But I love it when God says, look, all I know is that whatever God has, I want it. Whatever he can do, I, I want it. The great thing, I want it, I want it. And whenever I get to heaven, I don't know what I'm going to get, but I want it. I want all that I can get. You said you're greedy. 
I know. I know. When me and my brother, he's four years younger than me, if it was a piece of pie, well, I'll say two pieces of pie, a big one and a little one. Now, which one do you think I want? I, I'd want the big one. But of course, my brother, he wants the big one too. And so you could solve this very easy. Jesus would always give the biggest one to the person and take the littlest one. So I tell my brother, you be Jesus. See what a blessing I am? <laughs> Turn in your Bible to the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans in chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. In Romans in chapter 8, do you believe that as a child of God that you are indestructible until God is finished with you? If you serve the Lord, did you know that God can put a hedge about you and protect you as long as he wants? And to believe that I am walking and living under the protection of God. You see, I believe in the providence of God. I believe that God can protect me. But if I jumped off the Empire State Building, say, God, if you don't want me to get hurt, I won't get hurt. Halfway down, hey, so far so good. But I have an appointment with the concrete. Now, I don't believe that's the will of God. I believe a man in the will of God, not out of the will of God, doing something stupid like that. Well, Lord, there's a Mack truck, and if you don't want me to get hurt, I won't, and you're right there in the middle of the street. Splat. Lord, I trusted you. Because of you dummy. You can't blame God for the stupid things that we do and then suffer consequences. But God said, if you serve me, if you honor me, did you know that God can put a hedge about you and protect you? And I want you to see this. Look in verse 37. Verse 37. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now here I know he's talking about salvation, and you can never be separated from the Lord. My eternal salvation is secure. Can never be changed. Nothing can enter into it. God can't change his mind. I can't change my mind. I have to go to heaven whether I want to or not. I do want to go. But when I trusted Christ as my Savior, he saved me and will take me to heaven when I die. And that can't be altered. That's why I know that I'm going to heaven whenever I die. He didn't do this because I promised that I won't be bad anymore. No, no. Well, I promised to be good from here on in. No, 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 no. He saved me by grace, without any preconditions, without any promises that I'd have to make. All I had to do is receive. Remember this, salvation is always receiving. It's never giving. So you don't give your heart to the Lord to be saved. You don't give your life to Christ to be saved. You don't give God good works. You don't give God anything to be saved. All you receive salvation. It is the gift of God, not a works list any man should boast. So anytime you hear people talk about you got to give, 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 give. That, that's not the gospel. Gospel is receiving what Christ did on the cross for us. And after we trust Christ as our Savior, he said, I'll never can. But the power that he has to do that and to keep my soul, I just simply believe if he can guard my soul that well, he can guard my body that well. And I believe the Apostle Paul was okay until God was ready for him to come home. When that old blade came across his head and severed it from his body, I believe that God was finished with his work. And all the apostles, most of them died horrible deaths. 
That's because God permitted them to die. I believe that Jesus died on that cross, but only because God the Father willed him to die. God could have intervened and stopped that from happening. But he didn't. He allowed him to die. And why did he die? To pay for our sins so that we could have as a free gift. Everlasting life. I want you to look there in Romans 8, 28. As a good soldier, you must understand this and believe this. This will help you tremendously. In verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. Do you believe God has a purpose? Yes, he does. Do you believe that his purpose is higher than yours? It is. Do you believe there's things God understands that you don't understand? He says, our ways are not his ways and our thoughts are not his thoughts. Now, if you can learn how to really know the word of God and think the way God thinks, and then you'll know more about the ways of God, how God does things. That he plants his feet upon the storm and rides upon the storm. He plants his feet upon the waters. And you know, whenever the Lord walks in the water, uh, you can't see the tracks. They're traceless. They're trackless. And God asked us to walk on water. That's why you can't really follow all the steps of somebody else. God has a course for you to run. He has something he wants you to do. You must believe that God wants me in his service. God wants me to serve him. God wants me to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I want to um, read one other verse to you, and then I want to share something with you. Look in the book of Acts. The book of Acts in chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. And look at verse, look at verse 19. Verse 19. Because it's so good. But look at this verse. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind. That means in dependence upon God. Because pride is dependence upon self. Humility is dependence upon God. So serving the Lord with all hum humility of mind and with many, get this, tears and temptations which befell me by the lion and weight of the Jews. Remember the, the song that I wrote? As I look back upon those years, it's clear to see a trail of tears. In every Christian's life, as you look back over the years, there could be a lot of times when you had some hardships that produced a lot of tears because it wasn't all happiness. It wasn't all joyfully. It's times of suffering and hurt and grief and loss. And they produce all of this. But you don't use that as an excuse not to be found faithful to the Lord. I know people who have lost loved ones and because they lost loved ones, well, I just don't go to church anymore or I don't do this anymore or I don't do this anymore because, you know, I, after all, you just don't know how I'll do How long do you think you're supposed to agree? The rest of your life? You're not dead yet. You still got a life to live. You don't want to use people as an excuse not to be found faithful. If my wife, listen to me, if my wife dies today and we bury her on Wednesday, I expect to be here next Sunday morning. Why should I use her as an excuse for me to be found unfaithful and not to keep doing like I'm supposed to be doing? I lost my son, but I couldn't stop serving God. God hasn't done anything wrong to me. Why do I turn my back upon him? Doesn't my testimony still count? Is this real or not real? I believe so. But there's a part of us that wants to find an escape, a loophole. Why I don't have to serve? Well, I'm flat-footed. I walk in my sleep. I went to bed. You name it, and people have got a reason why they can't serve God and why they got to get out of the military. Now, some people, it's true. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about in the Lord's work. Can I say that? I'm getting, I'm getting older. I'm so glad y'all just put up with me. But look what he says. In verse 20, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews, also to the Greek, repentance toward God, faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I go bound 
in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Serving the Lord, you don't always know what's going to happen tomorrow. That's what Paul said. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what's going to be tomorrow, the next day, or the next year. We don't know, but we keep on serving the Lord. And then look what he says. In verse 20, say that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. In other words, this is what I can look forward to. If I serve the Lord, I got a lot of heartache coming. I got bonds and I got afflictions coming. I got tears coming down the road. I'm going to be misunderstood. I'm going to be hurt. But he says in verse 24, but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. Finish my course means there's a place where it's going to be the end of the line. To finish it means that there's, a, there's an end point. Some people never started theirs. But he says, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. In other words, nothing's going to stop me. He said, I'm a soldier. I'm a soldier. Be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I'm a soldier. I'm a soldier. I consider myself that. I'm in the Lord's service. I'm a soldier in the army of my God. The Lord Jesus Christ is my commanding officer. The Bible is my code of conduct. Faith, prayer, and the word are my weapons of warfare. I have been taught by the Holy Spirit, trained by experience, tried by adversity, tested by fire. I'm a volunteer in this army, and I am enlisted for eternity. I will either retire from this army in the rapture or die in this army, but I will not get out, sell out, be talked out, or pushed out. I am faithful, reliable, capable, and dependable. If my God needs me, I'm ready. If he needs me to teach Sunday school, to work with the youth, to help with the adults, or just sit and learn, he can use me because I'm ready. I'm there. If he needs me in church, Sunday morning, Sunday night, midweek, doing revival or special services, I'm there. I'm ready. I am there to teach, sing, play, work, or worship. God can use me because I'm there. I'm there. I am a soldier. And listen to this very carefully through this. I'm a soldier. I am not a baby. No one has to call me, remind me, write me, visit me, entice me, or allure me. I'm a soldier. I am not a wimp. I am in place saluting my king, obeying his orders, praising his name, and building his kingdom. No one has to send me flowers, gifts, food, cards, unless it's a gift card. Candy or give me handouts. I don't need to be coddled, cradled, cared for, or catered to. Because I'm a soldier. I am committed. I cannot have my feelings hurt bad enough to turn me around. I cannot be discouraged enough to turn me aside. I cannot lose enough to cause me to quit. When Jesus called me into this army, I had nothing. If I end up with nothing, I still break even. I will win. My God will supply all of my needs. I am more than a conqueror. I will always triumph. I can do all things through Christ. Devils cannot defeat me. People cannot disillusion me. Weather cannot weary me. Sickness cannot stop me. Battles cannot beat me. Government cannot silence me. And hell cannot handle me. I'm a soldier. Even death cannot destroy me. Oh, when my commander calls me from this battlefield, he will promote me to captain and then bring me back to rule. This world with him. I am a soldier in God's army. I will never surrender to the enemy. I will never turn back. I'm a soldier marching heavenward. 
claiming victory as I go. And here I stand, for I am a soldier. Are you a soldier? Can you take a stand? Do you know what you believe? Do you know why you believe what you believe? What does it take to get you sidetracked, chasing the things of the world? What has the devil used to get you out of the service? What lie has he told you to cause you to be A-W-O-L? Did you know not to serve the Lord? People say, well, I just can't afford to serve the Lord. I can't afford not to. There's too much at stake. There's too much at stake. Don't you believe that you are important and God needs you? Because the Bible says he does. I've had people say, well, God doesn't need you. He can always use anybody else. Yeah, he can, but he wants to use me. You ought to say in your mind, God wants to use me. God wants to use me. And you ought to say in your mind, I want to be used. I want to be used. Life will be over soon. Some of us are slowly moving on up. Yesterday, after we left the Awana meeting, we drove over toward St. Cloud. And a man there by the name of Jerry Lloyd had a son, 25 years old, to be ordained. Seven or eight of us sat in a room, and we grilled this guy. See what he believes on a lot of issues. And he was very good, very sharp. And then they asked me if I would say something during the meeting. I read this to him. I says, I'm on the downhill side of this soldiering business. My course is almost run. And I says, you're 25 years old. I says, I've got you by a full few years. I says, no, you have yet to run your race. You have no idea what's out there, but you're a soldier. You're listening to fight. And so the devil is going to do everything in his power to ruin your life. And if he can't get at you, he's going to try to go through the kids. Can't go get you through the kids, he's going to try to go through your wife. Can't get there, he's going to try to go through someplace else. Or somehow he's, he's going to act and he will not stop all the days of your life. He'll just try to change it from one place to the other. And you have to keep battling all the time. The devil is real. The battle is real. The war is real. The Lord is real. Your servant, the Lord, should be real. Look up here. This hand represents you and me. And I want you to watch me. I know that every time I pull out my wallet, everybody starts putting down their Bible and doing all this other stuff and there's movement all over the auditorium. Because you know what I'm going to say. But it might be distracting to somebody else that sits here and says, what's going on? What's going on? If I, get right here. I want you to watch me as though you've never heard it before in your whole life. Because this is so important. This is you and me. This is sin. We all have sin on us. Now God says that he loves us. He hates our sin. And he wants us to go to heaven, but we can't go to heaven because we've all sinned. Sinners can't go to heaven the way we are. If we go the way we are, we'd sin in heaven. So God says the wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God in a place called hell. But he loves us and he wants us to go to heaven. And God so loved the whole world. But you see, we can't go to heaven unless we're perfect, and none of us are perfect. We've all sinned and come short of God's perfection. So God says you can't save yourself. That's why good works will not get you to heaven, won't even help. So a man needs a Savior. This hymn represents Jesus Christ. He's the Lord God in the face, came into the world because he loves us, hates our sin, because it separates us from him. So Jesus Christ took all the sins of the world, paid for it on the cross, came back from the dead. And God said that if you and I would believe he did it for us, that he'd put that payment to our account and we get to go to heaven. Understand this. Jesus Christ is the payment for our sins. He was the propitiation 
He was the payment for our sins. So when you accept Christ, he was the payment for my sins. That's why I can't go to hell today or tomorrow or to any time because I have a payment for my sins. Christ was the payment for my sins. I don't have any sins to pay for. He paid them all. That's why I can't go to hell. Do I deserve that? No, I don't. I'm a, a sinner and I ought to go to hell. But God loved me and he loves you. He wants you to go to heaven, but the only thing you have to do, the only thing you can do, will you believe that he did it for you? Would you believe he paid for your sins? If you believe he paid for your sins, he would put this payment to your account. You get to go to heaven for what he did. No tricks. But I'm so glad salvation is free and it's a gift. And all you have to do is believe it. Would you believe that he did it for you? If you do, then God says he saves you, gives you eternal life, and you get to go to heaven on what he did for you. Let's pray, shall we? Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. With head bowed and eyes closed, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to have you stand up or come forward, but I am going to ask you in just a moment to raise your hand. Raising your hand doesn't save you. It just lets me know that what I said made sense to you. And you're saying, preacher, that made sense to me, and right now... I will trust Christ as my Savior. So with head bowed and eyes closed, if you'll trust Christ right now as your Savior, I'd like to pray for you. Would you just slip your hand up very quickly and put it right back down? If you've never done it before, but you say, yes, I'll do it right now. And preach, I'd like you to pray for me. Would you just slip it up very quickly? No, no. Just slip it up real quick and put it right back down. No, no. If you have trusted Christ as your Savior, you're God's child and you're, his, you're going to heaven. But you need to think about this serving the Lord business. Not to get to heaven, but because we're going there. Our Father, we thank you so much for your blessings to us. We thank you so much for loving us, giving us eternal life, and the privilege to serve you in the greatest army in all the world. And Father, we just commit ourselves to you, and we thank you for what you've done, what you're going to do.